Hey everyone, Weston Akamura from Real Vision in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and today uh, I have the honor of bringing Mr. Rory Johnston, someone who I consider to be one of the best independent research analysts in the commodity space and to Real Vision YouTube. Thanks so much for having me, Weston. Yeah, so um, for those of you uh, who don't know, Rory is the uh, founder and author of uh, the Commodities Context Substack. For those who aren't familiar, the Commodity Substack is a deeply analytical, you know, institutional grade research. Um, very low bar to clear, by the way. But uh, by institutional grade research, I mean, well, it's an analysis platform of, of extremely high value to me personally as a trader. Um, and that I actually incorporate into my own views uh, and take into consideration for when I trade um, and when I manage my positions. But as a trader, you know, when it comes to fundamentals versus price action, um, say on stocks and fixed income, you know, I'm neither like a blanket brush off fundamentals as irrelevant noise type of person, nor am I, uh, you know, adopting fundamentals as automatically as a critical um with respect to price action, but by and large, fundamentals of a stock or fixed income do not affect prices and price action in and of themselves. Buy and sell orders of green and red blinking tickers are what affects uh, prices and price action of markets. However, commodities is the only asset class in which the relationship between real world fundamentals and market price action are inherently interlinked. So when Spot price on crude, on nat gas, on wheat, gold, lumber, frozen orange juice concentrate, like when they spike or when they plummet. That is where transactions on prices for physical delivery are clearing. So the fundamentals of commodities are reflected directly into price action of markets. And market price action is fundamental to the commodity and its production or lack thereof, um, or it's, you know, uh, storage and, and all these other sort of um, real world uh, happenings. So as a trader, because I rely on analysts like Rory um, and given what I've been seeing happen in commodity markets um, that have been impacting broader and seemingly unrelated markets on a cross asset basis, I figured why not just get Mr. Commodities uh, contact Substack in here uh, with me? Yeah, I think I think the there's this relationship between financial and physical commodities in that eventually uh, and on a very kind of uh, explicit schedule, uh, financial futures need to actually kind of converge with commodity price settlement. Um, you know, this is the classic example of, you know, when we think about uh, the forward curve uh, and people often think and people talk about it as a you know, forecast, uh, the market's view of, of, of the where, where crude's pricing or, or where crude's going. Uh, but I think a more accurate uh, a kind of assessment of the futures curve is the financial and physical markets kind of coming together to make sense and, of a value and, and, and kind of uh, fundamental structure of the commodity market at that particular kind of point in time, a snapshot, if you will. So when the uh, futures curve is kind of higher uh, at prompt, so today, than it is in the future, we're in backwardation. And that's basically signaling that, like we are right now, that the market's very, very tight, that we need to continue to drain uh, oil out of inventory in order to get it into that kind of scarce, uh, tight spot market. And conversely, you know, back when we were at, you know, at the, the initial innings of the COVID demand shock, uh, when the market was deep, deep in super contango, when you had a, a deficit on, on prompt, uh, kind of deliveries, what essentially that's doing is the reason that exists in that shape is to pay for the necessary inventory uh, storage costs associated with it. So this is how you see a direct connection between commodities, particularly like crude, uh, that have kind of cost of carry, that have kind of physical realities and logistics side. Uh, and that you know, structure is required to pay for the necessary inventory to clear the market and make sure you don't just have, you know, you know, crew just sloshing everywhere out of out of tanks. So that I think is 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 the connection uh, on the other side going the other way. I think part of the part of what uh, the financial market brings to the commodity market is a, a kind of speed and pace and forward lookingness that often commodities have trouble with because it's a very, very slow moving sector, because we get a lot, a lot, a lot of this data on a lag. You know, most of my data is two month lag. 
Uh, and so, so I think we watch, uh, you know, the financial uh, markets bring a tremendous amount of information, you know, uh, the direction and kind of trajectory of spreads, you know, uh, calendar spreads in the shape of the curve, like I was just saying, bring us a lot of information for what's coming down the line that we'll eventually begin to see in our data. Right. So you brought up so much, so many like points there. Um, let's just let me just go back to what you just said about um, crude overflowing. OK, now we're talking about uh, what was it? May 2020. Um, now, what happened was you saw front month crude contracts um, trade at minus thirty seven dollars per barrel, negative thirty seven. Uh, that sounds ridiculous for like, you know, that must be financial alchemy. Well, this is like, you know, this is what's wrong with derivatives. They do like things that are not real world fundamental. But actually, fundamentally, in the real world, there was just there was so much oil. There's not enough you know, uh, storage capacity. And literally, you would have to pay people to take oil off your hands. Apparently, at, you know, $37 per barrel. Just obviously, that was, again, that was for futures roll. Again, there weren't buyers for futures uh, that were about to expire in 30 minutes, or, you know, and and the stupid ETF that was uh, very long, uh, that that really just messed up their, their long roll, um, their long rolling position. But uh, those two do reflect one another, you know, in, in some sense, you know, at that, at that extreme. Right. Um, so, uh, it isn't that like, um, you know, that, that financial futures and fundamentals could get so out of whack because as you said, they do have to eventually converge and spot price is where you want, is where you are going to transact if you mean to buy it or deliver physical. Right. So, uh, by, you know, by, by that very fundamental structure, um, they can diverge all they want, but they have to meet at some point. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if we look back at it was it was actually April 2020 when we saw when we saw that that close at April 20th. I'll never forget the day, April 20th, 2020. Um, oh, right. Yeah. For, for, for the negative. Right, for, for exactly. For the four May contracts. That's correct. Right. Um, but yeah. that was the day we actually went negative. And I remember my phone kind of ringing off the hook, you know, what the heck is going on? And, and like you were saying, it's there was indeed some I would call it you know, uh, financial tomfoolery going on on top of everything else. I think Bloomberg, for instance, has done a lot of good uh, reporting on what what they called the Essex boys um, and, you know, their ability and their kind of drive to, to drive, you know, uh, you know, really, really uh, illiquid, you know, distressed contract at that stage to even more extreme depths. But that couldn't have happened if the oil market was functioning correctly at that time. And what we saw at that stage was, through the kind of spring and, and, and into the summer of, of 2020, we saw global oil inventories hit all time record highs, like like the both in terms of the kind of absolute level and in terms of the pace at which they grew. It was truly, truly staggering. So you did legitimately have people worried about hitting tank tops. You had people worried about where would we put this crude oil? And that's how you get into a situation where, um, you know, even even if the price isn't going for outright negative levels, like like it did on April twentieth, where you're actually kind of transacting theoretically at spot and you're paying someone to take the crude, that's a truly wildly distressed level. Uh, we do actually see that every once in a while in other markets, like we saw it uh, for certain kind of barrels behind pipeline bottlenecks and stuff like that as well. So similar, uh, you know, uh, relations uh, kind of work out on a on a micro level, but to have a kind of a major contract with WTI do it was pretty unheard of. But even if even if it's not outright kind of the flat price is negative, when you have a market steeply in back in contango rather than super contango, that you effectively are pay, you're paying people to say, you know, please take this oil from me today. I will pay you ten, twenty dollars a barrel to hold it for six to twelve months. So you are, I mean, I mean, even in the normal kind of non-insane, uh, you know, activity of April twentieth, you do see people, you know, fun, you know, functionally paying people to take their oil and then buying it back from them effectively later down the curve. So I, you know, I think that is something that 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 happens, and I think that's something that I think makes the oil, you know, uh, commodities markets writ large so interesting in their kind of. Like you were saying, in, in their kind of, you know, very concrete, explicit kind of reckoning that needs to happen between physical and financial commodities on a fairly regular basis. Not like, you know, in equities where, you know, things can go out of whack for, you know, years and, year, you know, a prolonged period of time. You can get deviations in, you know, valuations or whatever else. Um, you know, every single month, functionally, uh, you do need to see some kind of, you know, very explicit reckoning between financial and physical commodities. Right. Um, and so with that said, um, so minus $37 per barrel for crude. 
that's pretty. Re- that's kind of insane. <laughs> um, uh, I can't really think of any other time that would be more insane uh, other than uh, oh, right now into the, <laughs> in the calendar year twenty twenty two, especially from March on. Um, so we uh, basically saw. I think it's something like about seventy percent uh, from. Uh, the 1st of January to peak on uh, crude. And uh, we also saw a subsequent pullback, um, a, a pretty sharp one at that, uh, from from those highs. I, I believe crude, um, WTI crude was 132 or something like that. Um, you know, basically fall on 25% from, from that level. And so we're kind of meandering around. Either way, my point is that volatility in, in we'll talk about crude for now, but commodities as a whole, but like crude it has been insane. Um, and yes, there is a, uh, there, there's, you know, a, a whole, a whole host of reasons, um, geopolitical, there are supply, uh, supply crunch issues, um, and, you know, a lot of uncertainty. There is, um, a, there's just like a lot going on at the same time, but, uh, Rory, would you say on a fundamental level that this kind of volatility where crude goes from under a hundred popping up through 130? Back down to the hundred, you know, area back below hundred, um, and then back up within a very short amount of time. Is that justified by the fundamentals, or is that financial speculators shoving markets around uh, without any regard for fundamentals? I would say it's one of these very interesting moments. And if you look at a chart, you know, the long history of of, of any oil price, WTI, or Brent, or whichever you choose. The moment around kind of February and March 2022 look staggeringly bizarre. Like the, the pace of ups, the pace of downs, it's basically becoming this almost just rectangle on the screen, how tight this thing is trading in this band. So it, we are in an, a truly wild, volatile environment. And to answer your question, is it is it speculation or is it fundamental? I would say, you know, uh, you know, uh, unsatisfyingly, perhaps, it's speculation about fundamentals. And I think what we're seeing is that so just to kind of give a little bit of a backdrop for how, you know, where we found ourselves going into uh, the kind of February invasion of Ukraine by Russia, um, oil markets were already extremely tight. There was, you know, it, it didn't, it was well before the invasion of, of Ukraine that we saw oil kind of grind up from, I think it started 2021 around $50, give or take. It, it you know, ended the year uh, or, or just before uh, the invasion at around 90. So that was all, you know, ex-Russia influence. During that period, the oil market was undersupplied by about 2 million barrels a day, based on our data. Uh, you know, to give a sense, uh, that's about 2% of global supply. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but that deficit sustained for that duration of time is very rare in the market and was enough to bring inventories all the way back down from those all-time high peaks that I mentioned kind of earlier, well back down to not just, you know, pre-COVID levels, but well below that all the way back down to kind of the average inventory level for OECD tanks uh, in the 2010 to 2014 period when oil was regularly, structurally, sustainably above $100 and people thought it was going to stay there forever. So I think, you know, that was the backdrop before we came in. Um, Now we find ourselves, okay, so let's say we're ish 2 million barrels a day short going into uh, the um, Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, then we, then we have, okay, now this massive potential loss of Russian barrels comes down the line on top of that. You could be talking a doubling of that deficit. You could be talking a, a tripling of that deficit, depending on your assumptions of what's going to happen in Russia, um, specifically around the degree to which we will see explicit bans like those that have occurred in Canada, where I'm at, uh, in, in uh, the United States, uh, the UK and Australia, have explicitly banned the import of, of Russian oil. Uh, so that's obviously, that's going to be one kind of, you know, clamp down on, on, on potential markets. Uh, but now, but, but the larger impact is actually this voluntary self-sanctioning that you're seeing companies uh, undertake. Uh, the most notable example of this was actually uh, Shell, uh, that it took, a, you know, I think reasonably uh, bought a, 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 a cargo of Russian crude oil um, and, and kind of justified by saying, look, OECD governments don't want us to, you know, uh, clamp down on Russian energy exports. This is back, you know, a couple, you know, a month or so ago when energy exports from Russia were a very strong red line, uh, particularly given the inflationary uh, environment, particularly given all the, the stress that the economy was already taking. They didn't want an additional energy shock that we really functionally have seen uh, on top of that. 
But what you saw companies doing were, you know, they're like, well, we don't want to deal with the legal headache. We don't want to deal with the PR headache. Uh, and in Shell's case, you know, even though I think reasonably they were justified in buying that crude oil based on government kind of directives, um, wa- you know, walked it back within a couple of days and released this massive mea culpa saying we won't buy Russian crude like ever again, at least as long as the crisis is going on. So all this together, you're probably and I, and I wrote a piece on on my Substack uh, about kind of, you know, parameterizing the Russia shock. And you're probably talking somewhere in the ballpark of one to four million barrels a day of oil lost. So again, thinking about two million barrel a day deficit before that, at the at the lower end, we're going to expand that deficit by fifty percent. At the high end, you could up, you could potentially triple that deficit. So I think all that together just shows the wide range of possibilities on the fundamental side. So, and as I was saying earlier, the data comes very very slowly on the fundamental side. We get increasingly higher frequency, higher frequency uh, with tanker tracking and everything else, but it's still relatively slow in the scheme of things. We don't really know what's going on. Whereas financial markets. Every single day are, di- are digesting massive amounts of news flow, particularly on the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And essentially, uh, for a little while there, the oil, you know, the oil price became effectively a geopolitical risk barometer of what was going on, uh, you know, at the border between uh, Russia and Ukraine, what the prospects were there. So I think all that together, uh, it's speculation for sure. But I think it's speculation based on kind of trying to figure out where the fundamentals are going to land. And because everyone just doesn't know, um, I I think that kind of volatility to a degree is justified. At the beginning, you know, when I wrote that piece on, uh, I was mentioning on the Russia shock, uh, the morning I posted it, there was a massive, uh, you know, uh, new deal announced or or potential for, uh, you know, a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. And I remember noting at the top, I'm like, well, I, you know, okay, well, I I released this on the day that this comes out and prices were massively down on it and everything else. But it turned out to be a complete mirage, you know, more kind of uh, deception from Moscow. Uh, So I think this just keeps going over and over and over again. I don't see it stopping anytime soon. Yeah, um, I I took note of that that piece that you were talking about. That was in the beginning of March, I believe, right? Um, yeah, yeah, because that was when I was trading crude, um, and <laughs> that's when uh, I had I have a trading video about this. But um, so I'm, you know, my my kind of sweet spot. So I trade options on futures and and futures directionally sometimes, but mostly options and futures. But I basically went long. Uh, 100 strike calls, which for which there was a massive amount, a wall of open interest in in 100 strike calls on WTI, uh, and the uh, front month um, underlying was in the 90s, and then I just saw it just start to break through all these uh, you know certain levels and all of this sort of uh, you know delta hedging activity happening um, uh, on sort of the, the dealer side, and so I went long you know with the 100 strike. Cr- uh calls and then about 11 or 12 hours later i was out of that for i think a four or five x return but i sold it right at 100 strike because that was a a key level for you know i'm just looking at from a market's mechanics perspective but it also does seem to like you know that's what it's so difficult is like that i think that i am trading this correctly um and i always have this thing about being right for the right reasons or being right for the wrong reasons you know like if i'm long a a stock xyz um because i believe that they're going to knock the ball out of the park um on earnings or i think that there's gonna be a takeover bid for for, well it's gonna be taken over by some other company and so i'm buying calls on it like that's 40 percent out of the money or whatever and then let's say like the next day the stock rips 40 percent higher and i you know directionally am correct but the reason it did so was because some idiot short uh, idiot hedge fund got caught in some short squeeze and they had to you know close their position and got short, short squeezed up and that's why i went higher was i directionally right yeah was i right for the wrong reason right for the right reasons absolutely not uh i was what we call luck <laughs> right and so uh when i when i do like you know these sort of trades on on crude or um Crude is really all I trade on in terms of the commodities, but like uh, in terms of if I'm looking at price action, there does seem to be a fundamental story that also aligns with a you know mechanical um, sort of financial markets like reason um, for for the price action, and it's very hard to discern which is which is which, and if markets are um, reacting to that fundamental story or if this is just sort of a natural mechanical sort of thing, um, and so that's really why I wanted to bring you on because. Uh, I am. I'd like to think that I'm decently good at what I do in terms of financial markets. You are the best uh, independent 
you know, commodities and especially crude fundamental um, analysts out there. And so I think you and I can combine uh, our respective powers. Uh, you will do most of the heavy lifting, obviously, um, <laughs> because I'm the class clown. <laughs> um, but uh, but I th- that's why I thought this would be, you know, uh, this is this is why you're here. And so uh, I just want to let everyone know, like, so uh, Roy and I, we spoke before uh, once and it was kind of hilarious because what we were talking about was, Rory, you were making the case for me as like... Um, there are these are markets these are financial markets that are you know dictating and driving prices on crude and on commodities and i was arguing back to you like no man it's the fundamentals like and we were kind of you know we had our um our roles reversed almost um and and i thought that that was very amusing uh i don't know how amusing you found it <laughs> but uh but um but but it's it's true though you were almost making you know this this argument for the case like, like no these are the financial markets are um are are behind this um and and then you start lifting off all these reasons that you know like uh these fundamental reasons and i'm saying like yeah that volatility uh, that you see in financial markets is reflecting those uh, fundamentals that you write about or that you talk about, right? So, I mean, it's very difficult to 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 discern that right now. I feel like you know. Yeah, and I think just to, again, I think so. Before I kind of laid out how we were kind of resting going into the Russia shock, uh, but I think to your point about like how is this volatility fundamentally justified, and I think. I think financial markets are, are obviously showing you that it's happening, but I do think that they are, it is justified on a fundamental basis. And because, so just let's just put, you know, let, let's talk about big, four big things. So let's talk about, you know, the three biggest producers of the world, of oil in the world, and the biggest importer of oil. So, you know, on all of them, we have massive, massive forecast ban, you know, error bands around right now, because we just don't know what is honestly happening to the degree where I think we're used to. Normally, one thing kind of goes haywire and we focus a lot on it. We kind of overanalyze it. But now it's like all of the big pieces are acting completely erratically and we're not really sure what to expect. So let's just go through them one by one. The United States is, you know, and the shale patch, this is what broke the oil market. This is what kind of everyone's been focused on for the last decade. Um, the, you know, the shale patch is kind of short circuited. Uh, everyone's talking about why is it is it capital discipline? Is it, you know, uh, supply chain bottlenecks? Is it ESG or some kind of regulatory burden? But for whatever reason, U.S. shale is not nearly as price sensitive today as it was pre-COVID. I, you know, just to remind people, in 2018, when oil prices for Brent averaged about $65 a barrel, the U.S. shale patch grew, uh, you know, U.S. supplies, total liquids basis, by about 2 million barrels a day, uh, you know, for the year on average. To put that in context, the entire world only grew demand by something like 1.4 or 1.5 million barrels a day. So, it, you know, the U.S. alone grew by more than global demand with prices in the 60s. Now we're seeing maybe we're going to be lucky to get, you know, half of that. You're lucky to get a million barrels a day of growth out of the U.S. Uh, with prices above 100. So that is completely changed. I, I, I really don't. I think that alone would have been enough to occupy markets for the better part of the entire year, trying to figure out how that was basically shaping up and kind of structuring the future, re-anchoring the back of the curve, everything else. So on top of that, you've also had, uh, you know, Russia and this Russia shock. We just talked about it. And, you know, this one to four million barrel a day kind of uh, uh, incremental deficit or supply loss range that we can expect. Uh, so, you know, Russia is the second largest exporter in the world. Each of these countries I'm talking about, yeah, U.S., Russia, and, and soon to come Saudi, um, are all ex- producing about 10 to 13 million barrels a day of oil, uh, crude oil a day, depending on how you count. But so on Russia, we're talking, you know, massive losses. Uh, and then finally, we, we shift to Saudi. And Saudi Arabia has always been this kind of steward of the oil market, you know, central banker. It likes to at least conceive itself of a technocratic central banker of the oil market, uh, you know, uh, modulating supply uh, in order to kind of bal- uh, really reduce all else equal, reduce volatility. And this is what we've been talking about is volatility. Um, so what we've seen in Saudi Arabia as well is this complete sea change in how they kind of approach the market. Um, you know, the fact that we saw over the past couple of months, multiple different members of OPEC, you know, UAE, Iraq, and others have come out and say, well, maybe uh, OPEC should lift production to kind of, 
you know, offset some of this, these Russia supply losses. And the fact that Saudi Arabia has not only kind of been radio silent on the matter, but, you know, has been reported to have, you know, explicitly refused calls from the White House on the subject is completely unheard of. You know, that is just not the way that Saudi Arabia has, has historically behaved. And we can speculate as to why that's changing. I think the most likely cause is the fact that Mohammed bin Salman has taken over larger and larger swaths of control of the Saudi kind of state, uh, including military. And in this case, the oil, the oil uh, kind of industry and, and Aramco. Um, that, I think, has, has injected a new level of politicization and potentially strategic kind of considerations beyond just a technocratic view of and stabilizer of the oil market. And then the final thing, the fourth thing, is China. And I think, you know, what we're, what we're seeing in China right now is you were talking the largest importer in the world of crude oil. And now, we're, you know, we're seeing rolling and increasingly draconian lockdowns across much of China. We're seeing it feels like every couple of days we're seeing, you know, another mega city locked down completely. Um, we're, you know, this is depending on the numbers. Again, we're seeing, you know, is it two million barrels a day? Is it three million barrels a day lost? The fact that we're talking and just throwing around million barrel a day volumes right now is you know, staggering. That doesn't normally happen in the oil market. And I think that the fact is that you could basically construct a, 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 a supply demand forecast right now reasonably that shows two completely different scenarios. One market kind of gradually coming back to balance. Another one that you see this massively widening deficit. I think the fact of that kind of reasonable uh, degree of potential disagreement between fundamental outlooks fundamentally justifies the amount of volatility we're seeing because each headline is essentially getting priced in immediately and violently. So, I mean, so Rory, I, I love the fact that you're talking about the the fundamentals of price action, almost, right? Um, and, and so, because the term fundamentals, like, they really are very interchangeable when it comes to commodities. Um, and so, here's actually somewhere where I want to pivot. So, um, in March, specifically on March seventh uh, or March eighth for me, really, um, because you know, twelve hours ahead. But this is a very significant day in global markets. And I think that the vast majority of market participants have completely overlooked this. Um, but if you look at this chart, um, you know, that I have of this, you can really insert any sort of commodities, uh, you know, futures uh, price here. But uh, this particular one, I basically have the Bloomberg Commodity Index. So it's going to, you know, encapsulate all, all commodities, really. Um, and on laid on top of that, you have crude. You also have tr U.S. Treasury futures. Okay, so that's not the yield. That's actually the U.S. Treasury price. So when that goes down, the yield is going up and vice versa. And then uh, yen futures. So again, that's also going to be inverse to USDJPY as we normally know dollar yen. And you'll see that on a specific point in time on March 7th, um, that marked the top of so many things cross asset simultaneously, right? It wasn't just the fact that it happened across like commodities. And again, so this is just the Bloomberg Commodity Index, but that was that was LME nickel blow up day, day two of blow up day. Um, that was like uh, right before um, and leading into crude blow off top 130 and then like, you know, fall back down day. That was the top in um, for that moment in in wheat, in corn futures. Um, in a lot of soft eggs, uh, in uh, copper, you name it. That was also, like I said, that's that was the point from which U.S. Treasuries just went on a straight line down directional sell off that we're still uh, experiencing. Looking at same with yen from that point straight down, um, and that in terms of equities, uh, that was the top in VIX, and that was also the bottom in. Mm -hmm. SX5E or Euro stock, basically the European uh, Equities Index, uh, the, the the bottom for that. And then we start seeing a directional upwards movement uh, in, in equities. So that moment was very significant, clearly. And what I was saying uh, on Twitter was crude is the new VIX. And when I, when I say like, I don't mean that literally, I just, because obviously the VIX still exists, so there is no new VIX that is needed, right? But um, what I meant by that was that Crude was uh, trading inverse to equities, uh, or rather equities were tra trading inverse to VIX, or uh, inverse to crude. Uh, and so that day, it seemed to be that uh, in just kind of my analysis, my looking around, and my guessing, if you will, that you had 
20 something commodities in backwardation. You had fr- um, spot prices that were surging. And what that does is it creates margin calls. If you're a producer and you're short a commodity uh, future, in order for you to just do your basic operations to be able to plant corn and grow corn and sell, you know, if you, if you sell wheat forward, if you short oil, if you're an oil producer, whatever it is, if you have a, sh- a short that's blowing up in your face and your, your hedge is now your risk, how does that actually change the fundamentals of actual oil production, you know, farming, um, production of, of of weed of commodities of, of all that kind of thing right so i want to ask you that but uh but specifically up like that date march of march 8th march 8th i mean yeah we could attach any headline we want to it but was uh, would you say that like did you notice anything from that um did you see anything according to that like that very significant date that everyone seems to have overlooked um because to me it just seems like a mass liquidation of anything that is a derivative contract um, that uh, triggered others, um, and you just saw this simultaneous multi cross asset global risk, uh, um, you know, uh, unwind of, of, of positions. Yeah, I think that I think that it kind of goes back to what I was saying about um, kind of just the the degree and the the volume of uncertainty related to Russia, because that was the, that was around the day that you saw kind of oil oil, like you were saying, peak. Everything kind of peaked then. Um, and what, what I think you saw was at that stage, we were just, you know, the market was in full panic mode. And then you, as you kind of rightly note, you had a bunch of these kind of, you know, uh, you know, spin off and runoff kind of effects as it kind of rippled through the, through the kind of call it the, the, the plumbing side of the, of the financial markets through these margin calls and everything else. What we have definitely seen is, you know, two things I, w- I would note here. One, uh, normally what I would look at for um, you know, uh, thinking about um, a speculative positioning in, in in futures markets, particularly for crude, because I, w- I would look at the commitment of traders, you know, um, uh, commitment of traders uh, report from the CFTC, uh, and and that has a managed money component. And that's what I typically look at, you know, both in absolute levels uh, and in terms of kind of percentage of open interest. What we've seen since all of this volatility started was, you know, despite the fact that you would normally think, oh, wow, crude's, you know, wildly high and super volatile, this must be a lot of, you know, professional money managing speculators in there. But we've actually seen that proportion come down substantially, both in absolute and in terms of, of the kind of the relative share of open interest. So what's interesting here is that we've seen a lot of these lofty highs without the kind of voracious buying of funds that we would normally associate with things like the 2008 top. Um, So we've actually seen them go in opposite directions. Now, for me, that essentially says that, you know, one, it removes a lot of the downside risk uh, to, to crude prices at this level because your marginal seller would be these potentially overextended funds and they're not there. In fact, they have a lot of dry powder. And the next time we really see a move higher in crude, we could see that um, that dry powder come back in and, and really amplify a move up, particularly if it's a steadier kind of move up. And we, we talk about the kind of view on that later. But the other thing I would say is on your hedging comment, I think it's really true. And one of the things we constantly see right now is uh, comments from uh, the U.S. shale patch as an example that the current structure and the, the extreme backwardation of the market is actually kind of depressing the signal, the price signal that uh, crude producers receive and kind of makes it more expensive or at least reduces the effective price at which they can hedge down the curve and hedge their production out. So I think you're definitely seeing that. One thing I had, I had mentioned, and I think that um, what one other feature that we haven't talked about yet in this market is, is the use of the strategic petroleum reserve. Um, and one, and I, I wrote another piece on that about how you know what I hope to see from the from the release because if it's just a, a, a you know just to put in context we're talking about the largest SPR release in history uh, by a long shot we're talking about more than a million barrels a day just from the U S one point three or one point four including all of uh, the IEA allies but all of that together you know if it's just a dump uh, if they're just you know, you know pushing that crude at the door in order to kind of uh, di- you know. Uh, loosen up uh, prices, let's say, ahead of the midterms, as many have accused, um, that's a very, very bad policy because uh, it effectively reduces the price signal to, cons- to producers to produce more. Uh, and it's essentially, it's, a, it's like a Band-Aid solution. It's a, it's a temporary thing that's going to make things worse in the long run. But if you use both the uh, kind of policy-mandated selling and buying 
of the strategic petroleum reserve that, it could, that, that you, you could see is for every barrel that the SPR sells right now, you could be buying a futures contract 18 months down the line in order to not just depress the front of the curve, but kind of tilt the curve up and flatten it. Um, you know, we love to hear about curve flatteners. And I think this is this is this would be a way of thinking about it uh, from the oil markets perspective. And what they would do is it would actually theoretically increase the uh, the price signal, the effective price signal that's being received by producers. If the goal is that we want to see more oil production, particularly from the U.S. shale patch, increase the quality of it, you mean, or increase the actual price of it? Oh, increase the effective price. Because I, okay. I think if, if you think about, uh, if you think that the, because I think a lot of people will think that the spot price is the most important price, and some people argue it is, but other people argue that it's the price kind of, let's say, a year down the curve, because that's the price that most of these producers would be hedging at. And for in particular, they'd be kind of offsetting that spot that with that. So if you flatten the curve, you would increase the effective signal received by producers. Um, again, this is this is assuming that they care more down the curve and they will hedge. I think the other argument is maybe we just won't see any hedging because maybe oil producers are all very bullish right now and they don't want to lock in. Either they don't want to kind of give up that potential upside. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you. Is um, you know does volatil does the volatility of the activity in this um, in, in whether it's because of speculation or not, right? The fact is that there is a massive amount of uh, volatility that's breaking out to the upside on, on you know, uh, two dozen plus commodities um, and, and futures and all that, right? And then you have, like, when you have, like, um, I, I believe it was, so I think it was, like, a, you know, a, a day or two after that March 7th date, you know, I was kind of looking back and it was like, Looking. Oh, this is actually when you know around that that one thirty um, blow off top on uh, WTI day, right? That like I don't know if you remember. There was a moment during that day where literally April crude futures contracts fell like seven percent in one minute. Sixty seconds later, plus seven percent. There's a net fourteen percent swing in one hundred twenty seconds. Um, and what 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 two back to back opposing headlines? Is hit? Of, course, of course, there were on right. Um, this is what this is what comes with skyrocketing volatility and options activity. Um, but be that as it may, if that kind of price action is happening uh, in markets that depend on prices to be more stable than that, at least um, in order to uh, lo you know hedge and lock in so that they can do their real world activity and not just their green and red you know, blinking piece of paper, like moving around, shuffling around stuff, nonsense that people like me do. Um, the, like, I have to imagine that like, that's prohibitive to the production process. Um, so are they, are people, uh, you know, is that is that volatility in itself, um, therefore creating more supply squeezes because they're unable to either produce or they're unwilling to because they're unable to hedge, um, you know, they're whatever it is that they produce, be it crude or whatever, in the market. Is that like a dynamic that is happening and or certainly possible, but uh, probable? Yeah, and I think to your to your point, the seven percent down and then seven percent up. Um, that I think would be more an example of the of the bad volatility and kind of non fundamentally driven volatility that is driven more by these kind of um, financial market, you know, plumbing issues and kind of liquidity dry ups and everything else. So I think to that, part of what we're seeing um, as well is I think that while prices are obviously higher, um, for a little while at least, we didn't see equities chase the same, you know, those prices higher in, you know, when Brent, I think, intraday hit 139 a barrel. You didn't see, uh, you know, the prices of, you know, Exxon or Chevron or any of the other producers, you know, skyrocket up and come back down. And I think part of the challenge now is people that we're hoping that this kind of longer run, steady drive of, of stronger and stronger oil prices, we're going to bring in more and more investors, particularly generalist investors back into the space, which would boost equity prices. Because I think, again, the, the biggest thing that people constantly, you know, uh, mention when we're talking about, you know, uh, yeah, investment discipline and cash flow discipline in the U.S. shell patch is the fact that the equity markets have been punishing those that do try and grow. Uh, and they've been rewarding those that are, are maintaining dividends, growing dividends, buybacks, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need are higher overall equity prices in order to push those producers back into drilling and producing more again, which we need to actually, you know, solve the, the growing and growing market, you know, the supply demand deficit. So 
to your point about like, is this helpful or, or harmful? I think it's harmful because now people see uh, oil price, you know, rallies and the higher and higher price of oil as, oh, well, it's all Russia or it's geopolitical. It's so volatile, I couldn't even imagine getting into this now. Um, whereas before, if you look at the chart, oil had its up and downs, but it was a pretty constant, steady grind higher through 2021. And that was a very attractive uh, kind of environment for oil companies because it was, you know, you didn't see wild volatility. You saw kind of a steady incremental climb higher and higher back towards 100. And I definitely think even absent Russia invading Ukraine, we would have hit $100 a barrel, you know, through this year. Um, but it would have been probably a healthier uh, at least from the perception of kind of market participants, a healthier um, kind of climb to 100 and particularly uh, healthier from the view of the oil companies, which, you know, truly don't love. They love higher oil prices. They don't love this volatility nearly, you know, to the same degree. That is such a key point. Because people exactly are saying like this, people are saying like, uh, you know, so first of all, everyone knows that everybody is underweight. Um, that, that the energy sector, despite it being by far the uh, outperformer, uh, you know, year to date. Uh, but just because the underlying, you know, um, commodity is higher, does not mean that the equity price is higher because it does not mean it's good for business. It depends on how it gets higher or why it's higher. And if it's higher with, uh, if spot price is higher on crude, alongside a higher trending volatility um, of that of the commodity that's not good that does not entice capital into you know into those um into the, the like the equity or anything like that it, just because there's a, a higher oil oil price does not mean that it is bullish for the energy sector um and people just kind of automatically assume like higher oil, oil price therefore it should be, you know and that goes by the way that goes for gold and gold miners if you look at gold volatility if that's a super high like that volatility is not is not a uh, a good thing um, to the upside um, for those who are involved in those respective sectors, and I think that that's an extremely critical point that you uh, had had you know just mentioned that it's the path there matters really more so than the level itself is what I would yeah exactly and just to kind of and just to kind of pull it back to this kind of price v you know v fundamental outlook I think the other challenge we're seeing right now is the fact that. Most of the factors, most of those big factors that are driving, at least in the short term, uh, oil prices, uh, you know, you know, the, the China lockdown related demand losses are much larger and more immediate than what we've seen from the supply losses from Russia so far. So Russia, we know I, I called it in my piece a slow moving train wreck because we know it's kind of come off the tracks. But we don't know where it's really going. We don't know how far it's going to go. We don't know it's, if it's going to roll once or twice. Um, so we see it's getting worse and worse, but the law, you know, you know, the actual recorded and the data we're seeing coming out of Russia so far is not nearly as bad as I think it it, it will get and it definitely could get um, because not always seeing, you know, I, I like to say that we don't know what Russia is going to be, you know, exporting or managing to export in four months. We don't know what Russia is going to be managed to actually have a production capacity in a couple of years because as they lose their ability to export as they lose these export customers, that crew needs to go somewhere. If it can't go anywhere, they're gonna to need to shut it in. And that actually increases uh, you know, you know, the damage to these reservoirs because it typically reduces the ultimate cover reserve when you kind of have to force uh, forcibly close these uh, these wells in. So, you know, combine all of that to this is only gonna be getting worse over the course of the year, unless we see a very material um, reversal in Moscow's disposition, um, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, unless that fundamentally changes, and even if it does, it's not like any of these companies are going to, you know, storm back in and try and, you know, get, you know, re, you know, work with the Russians again. I think those damages have, you know, those um, those relationships and those business uh, relationships in particular have been kind of thoroughly poisoned at this stage. Um, so I think going forward, you know, eventually, uh, you know, the lockdowns in China are going to lift. You know, these are very, you know, the definition of transitory because you know the the waves don't last forever. Um, so that's going to eventually lift. We're going to see, uh, you know, whether or not it's two or three million barrels a day that we've lost. We're going to see that demand come back into the market. At the same time, we're going to see, you know, larger and larger losses of Russian supply uh, over the coming months. And then by by, you know, mid mid to end summer, we'll, we'll see uh, OPEC plus, which is, you know, theoretically been supposed to be incrementally adding in 400,000 barrels a day 
um, of new supply or withheld supply every month, which they've been falling short on. But, you know, you know, the production does continue to tick higher. That will that will end by the end of the summer, you know, beginning of the fall. So all that together, but, you know, fast forward to Q3, Q4, that's when the market begins to get, in my mind, especially tight because all of those bearish factors are are acute and short term, whereas I think the issue on the supply side is kind of equally severe, but slower moving. So I, I, I think that that coming forward, when people see right now the prices, well, they're jumping around, oh, you know, 139 for Brent intraday was the top. If you know, unless something fundamentally changes, unless we get a massive global recession or we or we see, a, you know, a massive turnaround in Russia, Ukraine or a massive turnaround in U.S. shale production and investment. I don't see a situation where we don't have rising, steadily rising, you know, higher and higher oil prices going into the end of the year, because we're just going to need to incentivize that production to come online from somewhere. Yeah, um, totally agree with you. Um Here's what I I'm just gonna throw out a uh, potential sort of scenario or or thesis or or wild guess if you want to call it that they're all synonymous with when it comes to me. Um, in the event that you get uh, this is probably unlikely but let's say Russia Ukraine gets solved let's say there's a ceasefire right announcement and it, this this thing these things could come immediately it could be happening right now as we speak uh, or Xi Jinping says you know what. China COVID zero this policy sucks. Done. We're we're done with that, right? Or both on the same day, right? Let's say something like that happens. Um, you would think that that would be risk on for markets. I actually think that that would be that might be a knee jerk risk on. That actually, I would think that that might be uh, a potential downside to risk assets because there are, like I said before, there's so many um, new entrants into this long commodities trade. Um, uh, by various financial actors in the institutional side as well as the you know the individual side, leveraged up and all that. And if they're leveraged long commodities, because uh, it's the only long trade that there is left that they're all piling into, and then those sort of headlines hit, those commodities get dropped. And if they get dropped, they're going to, those positions are going to get destroyed. And you're going to see, again, a massive sort of, of liquidations happening. Um, you know, if you get a 20% intraday drop in, in crude on, on an announcement of Ukraine, Russia, like ceasefires or like that, that's that's not going to be, uh, you know, a risk on, on like, you know, on, on E-minis and stuff like that. I think it's actually going to be quite the opposite. Um, it's just my, my view. Again, it depends on the setup and all that at the time, but I think that that's what, that's what could possibly come of that. Something to, a potential sort of, you know, scenario for people to keep in mind. Let me ask you something about, um, so with NACAS, right? Recently in Japan, we actually had uh, on FOMC day, so this kind of went brushed under the, under the rug, but we had a seven magnitude earthquake. And immediately after that, um, the like the government, the Japanese government, especially around Tokyo, was telling people just to like shut down their power. Um, and they were kind of systematically doing this because we were right on the edge of like blowing out the entire grid. And Japan was Immediate, immediate need of net gas. Also because of the fact that Japan had, just before this happened, diverted net gas shipment that from the U.S. that was headed to Japan. They diverted that over to Europe to help out with that situation. Obviously not knowing that this is going to be an earthquake. So Japan has has been, still to say, scrambling for net gas. And so I mentioned on Twitter that like if you want to play the short yen trade, Instead of going along USD JPY, you should do it with AUD JPY, Aussie dollar uh, yen, because the US JPY uh, trade is just strictly a monetary divergence thing, whereas the AUD JPY thing is both, you know, that, but you also get the commodity upside kicker from the Australian dollar. And Japan being the largest importer of LNG in the world, most of which comes from Australia, that would be sort of a way to do it. And when I looked at a chart um, that I sent to you, but like, you know, if you look at this chart, you'll basically see. Um, Aussie yen, dollar yen, kind of, you know, at first, like, they move more or less together, but then Aussie yen really starts to pull ahead. And Aussie yen not only pulls ahead, but it does so and starts to correlate with the, the price of US net gas. Um, and it does so right on that line, which is not FOMC day, but that's earthquake day. So my question is, like, just kind of, like, in a very basic, fundamental way, because I don't know how it works. Is it possible that Australian dollar is being bid up 
because because of um, Japan's day to day need and actual you know execution and transactions of um, you know buying nat gas on uh, at the spot market and therefore exchanging yen for Aussie dollars in order to transact and do so. Like, is can it be like that sort of day to day immediate um, that makes prices in both currencies and uh, the commodity itself uh, move in, in, in that way and correlate? Yeah, so I'm full disclosure, I am not a currency expert, nor am I an expert of the kind of uh, uh, gas market in Japan. But generally how you'd think it would work would be most LNG shipments are going to be on long-term contract basis uh, by volume. But particularly in emergencies, the only place you can go is into the spot market, uh, particularly at a time when global LNG and global gas supplies are extremely, extremely tight. Um, so I think, you know, that everything you're saying kind of makes sense. Um, just to kind of put it back to something I know a little bit more about in the kind of North American natural gas side, whereas you're also seeing uh, unheard of volatility for a long time and uh, prices that have risen to their highest point since 2008. And what you're seeing there as well is, you know, the entire global market where for gas, what it used to be very, very balkanized. Essentially, you had completely different gas markets in Asia and, and Europe and North America. But now, because all of those regions are building out their LNG uh, kind of export and import infrastructures, you're seeing that transmission uh, happening a bit more than it used to. Uh, and again, for, nat for natural gas to hit near in North America, to hit nearly eight dollars a million BTU. That is, you know, extremely high. Uh, relative to where it's basically range traded between 250 and 350 for most of the past decade. So I think you're seeing all of this kind of come together and strain these markets, which were already at points of kind of transitionary inflection, add in kind of low liquidity and high headline, you know, headline uh, kind of flow. All of the volatility is just completely out of anyone's normal well, what I would consider to be anyone's kind of normal risk management system. So, yes. you know, yesterday when, ga when natural gas prices in North America were rising uh, kind of, you know, to the highest points since 2008, about $8 a million BTU, people were like, okay, so who is the amaranth in this situation? That was a, a hedge fund that was, I believe, short nat gas futures and got and kind of got blown up. Uh, but that, that precipitates these giant melt-up events. And that's what, that's what it seems like in this situation is that, you know, there's just this giant melt-up happening. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping going to dig back into, you know, when the data becomes available, see what's really going on under the surface during all of this volatility. Because, you know, while fundamentals on the North American side look tight-ish, they don't seem tight enough to justify $8 gas. Right. And that's why. And yesterday we saw dollar yen breaking through 20 year highs. And I think that those are not independent of one another. So this is something to keep in mind for people who are looking at the yen. It's not just strictly a monetary thing. It's either a coincidence or it is actually Japan having to sell yen in order to get, you know, to procure much needed net gas that is on like a day to day, like, you know, um, uh, basis, and I think that you know that the data, I would love for you to, to you know fill some with data when that when that comes. Um, but uh, well, yeah. um, so I just want to wrap up here, Roy. I just want to say like the, the, like this this thought that came to my head was like uh, you are a you are a millennial, correct? Um, yes, yeah. yes, correct. So, uh, as, as am I, and it's 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 hilarious when it's annoying when people um, say like. You people, you millennials, you only know like a QE market and when they're talking about equities and like a QE was sort of like equities like only go up market and blah, blah, blah. And like this whole like trading desk full of like a generation doesn't have any idea what it's like in a non-QE market, which is the most ridiculous thing. Like as if we like what we we're, we don't know what, what, what history is. It's not history. It's just like a year before, like, you know, like before, before we enter this this uh, job market. But what I say back to that is like, OK, well, you people don't know anything except for a bond bull market for the last 40 years, too. So you can say the same exact thing here. And the way that that actually relates is that the let's call it everybody above uh, millennials does not know how to behave in financial markets in an inflationary environment, um, including policymakers, for that matter. And so they're Diving headfirst into commodities blindly, um, as we saw in March. And that is leading to a very cross-asset intercorrelated market that is stemming from 
commodities. So my point is that people who think that commodities don't matter or that's not a sector you look at or whatever, I don't care what it is that you are invested in that you look at or you trade. The fact of the matter is that the global financial markets are intertwined more so than ever, the, uh, and there are different like origins of drivers. And currently, that origin is the commodities market because that is where people are blindly along and they don't have any idea what they're doing in it. Uh, and so we need the Rory Johnsons and we need the commodities context subsex more than ever. Um, and I don't care what you invest in. This is what you need to pay attention to. I don't set the rules. I don't sound like I, you know, this is like I'm making this up. These are the cards that we're given. We don't get to, we don't have the option of like choosing what we get to pay attention to. Like, no, the world chooses for, tells us what we need to pay attention to. This is what we currently, this is what, how the table is set right now. So, uh, Mr. Johnson, you're in like, you know, like front and center sort of like spotlight right now, your sector and you especially. Um, so I, um, not just wish you the best luck, but we depend on you continuing to do excellent work. <laughs> so please keep it up. Um, and, and on a note, um, I believe that you have, uh, so, so everyone, not everyone, but like most people know that, you know, your commodities con uh, contact subsec phenomenal. If people don't, you know, haven't read it, read it. But you also have like a new sort of tier rolling out. Is that correct? Do you want to just give a, a little drop, a little hint uh, of, of what's to come for uh, for Rory Johnson's uh, up his sleeve? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, again for having me, Weston. Thank you for all the kind words about uh, about the Substack. Um, so I'm going to be rolling out a, a paid tier to Commodity Context uh, kind of in a month or so. Um, that will, in addition to the same articles and you know, digging deeper behind the scenes, uh, more frequent posts, and you know, uh, I think most importantly, a series of kind of monthly periodical reports that did, you know, that that kind of continue to track, follow, and quantify all of those trends and and stories that I've covered in the Substack. Um, so kind of with you know, you know, thousands or, or, or hundreds of charts and um, and data tables at the back to allow people to kind of follow track and kind of uh, incorporate some of that uh, information into their own system. So starting out, there's going to be a, a global oil uh, data deck, I'm calling it, and a Canadian oil data deck uh, that will kind of give you a peek into a bit of my back end uh, until the point that I, I in the future, uh, further down the line, will offer kind of a fuller data API or system. But for now, this will be a way of getting people a way of tracking, following, and you know, hopefully course correcting uh, kind of me along along the way uh, to see kind of um, you know how we can how we can make this kind of analysis better for everyone. Uh, you certainly have done a lot of uh, contributions to uh, my personal trading, um, which is why I have you on here, and I'm very very thankful for it. And I want to applaud you uh, for being a spectacular independent uh, researcher uh, and analyst uh, in the space. And we need you now more than ever. Fantastic. Well, thank you, thank you again for all your kind words, and thanks for having me on the, on on your channel.